Okay, I've got, I've got one. How about female to female? I've got one. I think coming up. Sorry? You got one coming up. Okay. I think one possible. All right. So I'll just tell you what I was going to say because the first few slides just have text on them anyway. Um, Hello? Good. Uh, the first few slides just have text on them anyway, so I'll tell you what it was going to say on them. And you don't get to see your bullet points. And I know there's an international law that says whenever you give a computer presentation, you have to have bullet points. So um, I could do that. Does, is there one I just draw there? Yeah, bad idea. So um, actually, let me whip it up here so I can see what I was going to do. Anyway, so what I'm here to talk about is Blender. How many of you know what Blender is? Okay, so many of you don't, and that's fine. What Blender is is a modeling and rendering and animation package, 3D modeling, rendering, animation package. Has, has anyone here used Maya, Lightwave, um, Aladdin? How many here ever had an Amiga? Oh, I used to love my Amiga. Um, anyway, it's, it's one of these things where you, you draw in wireframe in three dimensions, um, it is sort of the artistic equivalent of a computer-aided design program. And you can assign materials and textures and all sorts of stuff to the various objects that you create in 3D. And then you can have a camera that you move around in 3D, and then it calculates and renders what the scene ought to look like. This is how most special effects in science fiction movies are done for spaceships nowadays. They don't make models as much. They, they still do some. Um, has been now, I guess, for about 10 years. I know Babylon 5 was one of the first that you did it in a big way. But they, did they? No, not the original. That was back in the 70s. They didn't have computers then. Yeah, but they were, they had to count, I mean, they didn't, they had to do punch cards. To, so anyway, um, <laughs> anyway, um, what I use Blender for myself, well, I, I have to be very honest. The reason I use it is because it's fun to play with. But the excuse I give myself that I'm not wasting time when I'm doing it is that I teach astronomy at Vanderbilt. And um, there are some things that we do in astronomy that are, it's very difficult to get across that involves visualizing uh, relationships in space in three dimensions. Um, and I was going to show you, and I hope I will show you, some of the movies that I have made in Blender. And I was going to take you through how I made one of them, or not all the way through how I made it, but just the sorts of things that um, you can do in Blender to show how I do this. Now, I had one slide in there that said that Blender is a, um, let's actually, I'll find it. This is, it's full of all kinds of market speak. And I, you know, market speak is something I react to in about the same way as I react to bullet points. Um, it's a free, as in GPL, multi-platform, professional modeling, rendering, animation, and video sequencing package. Yay. Um, to which, to me, first of all, free means it's, um, it costs nothing. I did pay $100 for it, actually, but it costs nothing. Um, and source code is available. People hack on it, that kind of thing. Multi-platform, to me, means, yay, it runs on Linux. Um, and I guess other people can use it, too. Professional means, hey, it's cool, and it does more than I need. Um, modeling means no longer do I have to sit down and calculate out the geometrical form of every little thing that I want to render and put it into POV ray. How many here have used POV ray? All right, so some of you... Uh, know the love of creating everything in text files. Now, on the other hand, Blender includes a Python interface, so if you want to do that, you still can. Um, and that's something I have not done yet, but one of these days I'm going to put together my Spiral Galaxy Density Wave Simulator. Oh, oh. Wow. <laughs> I guess so. Um, Sorry? Is it supposed to be plugged in now? We'll find out. In focus. Searching. Setting up image. What will the image be when it's done setting it up? Yay! Very good. All right. Okay. All right. Yes, and, and Harry Boxley. Okay. See, look at this. It's not only bullet points, but it's appearing bullet points. Okay, um, so basically this is, just, this is what I've just said, and I think that was my second slide, yes. Um, Blender was originally made back in the 90s uh, as part of a Dutch animation firm that did animations for commercials and movies and stuff like that. It was their in-house software. Um, 
Later on, this company called Not a Number, N-A-N, which is something that means something to anyone who's ever done floating point computer programming, um, as a free professional level modeling and animation package, it never really made the kind of money it was supposed to make, even though it was in Europe, not the United States. The end of the dot-com bubble kind of took it out. And, and then in 2002, there were enough people who had been using this that wanted to keep it available. Most importantly, the guy who wrote most of it, um, Tom Rosenthal, um, talked to the investors in NAN and convinced them that, hey, if we can pay you, um, if we can pay you 100,000 euros, and at the time a euro and a dollar were about the same thing. I guess now it's it's, it's like 40 dollars to the euro or something. I lose um, track. They would give him the source code, and he, in three months it took, or two months, something like that, to get together enough money. Um, I, you know, I put in my $100. There were some large investors, but it was a large number of people putting in something like $100, rescued the source code, and then it came out thereafter as GPL, and so nowadays you can just do apt, get, install, blender. How many people here know what that means? Yeah, good, okay. Um, you can do apt, get, install, blender, and you've got it on your system. All right, so now the other part of this, why, as I said, visualizing 3D is hard, and it's harder than you think it is um, when you actually sit down and try to do it. It sounds like, yeah, that's fine. Stuff is here, stuff is there, stuff is moving. Um, trying to understand uh, how the stars move across the sky as the Earth rotates is very challenging. It's probably one of the hardest things that we do in introductory astronomy. Um, the seasons... Uh, the ecliptic path of the sun across the sky, which I'll show if I have time, phases of the moon, all of these are sort of very basic things um, that people find very hard actually to understand for two reasons. One, because we come in with all sorts of misconceptions um, about how it works, and two, because the real answers involve visualizing things in 3D space. So I use this tool to sort of look at things from the outside and then zoom in, and so you can actually see the zoom happening so you can see what connects to what. Um, and so I'll show you some of that in a little bit. Now, I want to see what kind of time I have here. There is one amusing thing. Yeah, it's for 25. All right, I'm going to attempt. Wish me luck. Where do you think my speaker is? All right, I'm going to attempt to play a movie that has sound on it, and I'm going to use the air gap from the speaker to here to see if this works. Is that guys an elk? A will... So an elk as in the animal or as in the club, right? This is from something that was... Um, that's virtual screens for you. This is something called a private universe, and it, it was interviews of students who had or had not taken astronomy at the Harvard graduation. Harvard students are supposed to be smart. Um, now, I don't think they're, they're smarter or dumber than anyone else. Do you want me to move over here? Actually, for a moment, I'm just going to, um, we're just going to, I just want to show about five minutes of this. Despite a lifetime of the very best education, students in our classrooms are failing to learn science. Can you all hear that? Many of these students will graduate from college with the same scientific misconceptions that they had on entering grade school. To test how a lifetime of education affects our understanding of science, we ask these recent graduates some simple questions in astronomy. Consider, for example, that the causes of the seasons is a topic taught in every standard curriculum. Okay, I think the seasons happens because as the Earth travels around, Sun, it gets nearer to the sun, um, which produces warmer weather and gets farther away, which produces colder weather, and then and, and the season. How hot it is or how cold it is at any given time of the year has to do with the, the, the closeness of the Earth to the sun during the seasonal periods. The Earth goes around the sun, and, and it gets hotter when we get closer to the sun, and it gets colder when we get farther away from the sun. 
exaggerated ellipse. Even though the Earth's orbit is very nearly circular, with distance producing virtually no effect on the seasons, we carry with us the strong, incorrect belief that changing distance is responsible for the seasons. I took uh, physics, planetary motion, and relativity and electromagnetism and waves. I've never really had a scientific background whatsoever, and I, and I got through school without having it. I've gotten very far without having it. I had uh, quite a bit of science in high school, yeah. Regardless of their science education, 21 of the 23 randomly selected students, faculty, and alumni of Harvard University revealed misconceptions when asked to explain either the seasons or the faces of the moon. When it's further away from um, the sun, then it gets colder. The Earth's position interferes with the reflection of the sun against the moon. I love the fact that the professor manages to give the same wrong answer, but does it in an incomprehensible way. <laughs> that says something. <clears throat> anyway, so th the point of all this is that people who have had astronomy find it hard to grasp, and I've taught introductory astronomy enough times to know that um, trying to get a handle of which way the stars appear to be moving as they rise and set and then saying, well, what does it look like to someone in the southern hemisphere? Trying to get a handle on all of that is more challenging than all the sort of flux, luminosity, distance relationship stuff we do. Even though the students like to complain that there's too much math, um, they do better with the math than they do with the, the more visual stuff. So um, I have this, um, the first video is this thing that describes the celestial sphere. Is anyone here an amateur astronomer? No. Okay, a little bit. So if you're an amateur astronomer, you know all about right ascension and declination in the celestial sphere. Basically, what the celestial sphere is, um, is, is we take, we've got the Earth here, and we've got this virtual, it's not real, sphere out there that we pretend all the stars are on. Now, in reality, all the stars are at least, the closest star is something like 10 million times farther away than the diameter of the Earth. So the Earth is a tiny little dot at the center of this. I've blown it up so you can see what's going on. Um, and then the celestial sphere has these two coordinates just like longitude and latitude, and then we pretend all the stars are right on them. They're not really. They're really spread throughout space, but if all you want to do is point at a star, all you have to know is which direction it is. You don't have to know how far away it is. And so then we use this to describe where the stars appear to be on the sky, and because it's a really simple model that lets us predict how things look as they rise and set. So I'll show you the movie I use. Okay, all right, so we start out here, you are in Tennessee. Now normally when I use this in class, I'll stop and pause the whole way through. I'll, I'll just sort of run it through here rather than subjecting you to my full half hour long lecture on the celestial sphere. But anyway, so the point is you saw the ball of stars there and here's the Earth at the center of it. The east-west coordinate is like longitude, but we call it right ascension. And for reasons I won't go into, we number it in hours. Here's declination in degrees, so it goes up to 90 at the North Pole, down to minus 90 at the South Pole. And then the whole sphere, and I'm blowing up the Earth, here's the clip I showed you earlier. The whole sphere is tied to the Earth. We've got the poles, we've got the equator, which is just the Earth's features extended out. Now what makes this hard is we're all standing off at some nutty angle to this. Right? Up is not north. And as the Earth rotates, we're going around in some nutty, we're not that big, some of us. Um, <laughs> All right, this is supposed to represent your horizon. Normally here I'd have paused a lot and talked about how what's above the horizon and what's below the horizon. Now, this is how we really see it, right? This is us. And as the Earth is turning, we're turning with it. So we don't see the Earth turning. To us, it looks like the sky is turning. But really, it's us that's turning. Um, and so right here, this is sort of the drawing of the model as we use it. Usually you make the Earth a little bigger. You've got the celestial sphere rotating around the poles, but then from the inside, you see things making low arcs in the south. As you look east, stuff rises up and to the right. Always kind of a surprise to people. When you look north, you may see the Big Dipper come through here. Some of, some of the stars in the north don't set at all. You look west, they're setting down and to the right. Um, now that's, you know, 
a quick zip through there. Um, normally I would sort of do that, and, and the real hard part, I'll just run this here and jump ahead a little bit. The real hard part is going from here where you've drawn the model and it's actually pretty simple, it's just one thing spinning, and doing that. Zooming in and saying, okay, what would it look like to somebody on the inside? But that's how you can answer basically all these questions. And being a professor, I gleefully ask all these questions on tests and homework and things like that. And to the chagrin of my student evaluations, um, you can answer all those questions just about thinking about that. Now, I'm not going to make you do that here uh, because it's hard, harder than it sounds, um, and because we don't have time for all that. What do we have time? Okay. I will ask you one question, though. Okay. So when we zoom in here, um, so here's, here's the sphere. Here's the way it's rotating. Here's a person in Tennessee looking south and then looking east. And notice as we look east, and I'll pause it, stars were all moving this way, up and to the right. Um, watch this sometime. If you watch Mars, which will come up tonight around 8 p.m. or something like that, um, or the moon when it comes up a little bit later, if you watch it, it's actually going up and to the right. If that's south, here, I'll do this for you. If that's south and that's east, stars sort of rise, arc through the sky. They rise up and to the right, not straight up because we're not at the equator. Um, if you were at the North Pole, they don't rise and set at all. They just move around, but they're off at this angle. What would a rising star look like to someone in the southern hemisphere? Which way would they go? Anyone? Now, really, I should have little colored letters, and you all hold that up, or little clickers, if you know of those things. Does anyone know what, from this model, and in fact, let me run it back a little bit, can you do this, put yourself as someone in the southern hemisphere, what would happen? Same thing, up and to the right? All right, let me show you another movie. Correct. All right, so here we've got two people. Here's one in the northern hemisphere. Here's one in the southern hemisphere. I've, we're looking at it from the other side, but it's the same model. Yeah, so we're facing east, and we see the stars rising up and to the right. Because you see that's east on the earth. Here's the north pole. Now all I'm going to do is rotate this model. Right? I'm not changing the way it's moving. I'm just changing the orientation of it. So now here's the southern hemisphere person. And we'll just zoom back in, up and to the left, right? And it's, there's nothing deep about it, but it does point out why it's so hard to visualize this stuff, right? It wasn't obvious, and it's not obvious to anyone. So you see southern hemisphere up and to the left, northern hemisphere up and to the right, and I just rock this thing back and forth three or four times. Yeah. You have to make the noise. All right, everyone? Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Good, okay. So anyway, I have, a, I have a few other movies that uh, are based off the same Blender file or I copy the file and change the animation around to answer a few questions like that. Um, there is, of course, the whole what causes the seasons thing, as you now know from you know, watching us sitting around ridiculing Harvard students. Um, it's not we are closer to the sun in the summer. And if you ever forget that, because it's obvious, when you're closer to something warm, you feel more energy coming off of it. Right? And this is actually a reasonable thing to say. Light a fire, walk closer to it, you're warmer than you are when you're further away. If the Earth's orbit were elliptical, yeah, the whole planet would be a lot hotter when it's closer to the sun than it's not. But actually, the Earth's orbit is almost exactly circular. And in fact, ironically, the Earth is slightly closer to the sun in our winter because the distance from the Earth to the sun makes almost no difference. Um, just remember that the southern hemisphere, when it's winter here, it's summer there. That You can't reconcile that with a sort of close to the sun answer because how can we be closer when they're further? So the real answer is it's entirely the directness of sunlight, which I try to demonstrate with this picture. Here's a patch of ground. And when the sun is high in the sky, so this is supposed to be sort of at noon in summer, the sun's high in the sky, I've got eight light rays lighting up this patch of ground. Count them up. Um, in the winter, the sun is lower in the sky. I have the light rays of the same distance apart here. Right? See, it's sort of one finger width. If you don't believe me, I can escape out. You can look at the grid and we can measure it. But believe me, because it's true. 
Um, same number, and now we've got one, two, three, four, five, six light rays. So you've got less total energy heating up the same amount of ground. There's a secondary effect with the fact that the days are shorter in winter, so, um, which actually is tied to the fact that the sun is lower in the sky, and we could go back to the celestial sphere and see that. So the whole season thing just comes from the fact that the sun is higher in the sky in the summer and lower in the sky in the winter. And the reason for that is... that the Earth's axis here is tilted relative to the plane of its orbit around the sun. So you see here's the Earth orbiting the sun, and you can see, and I've drawn the north and south pole huge on here, the axis is tilted relative to the plane of the orbit around the sun, and in a minute here I'm going to turn on a big extended equator plane. So you can see here, all right, you see here the, for the, the sun is south of the equator, Right, here's the northern hemisphere. So for somebody in the northern hemisphere, even at noon, the sun's going to be pretty low in the sky. It's below the equator. Oh, I went a little too far. Well, okay, here. Now here's the summer. It's high in the sky. This is about June 21st here. Summer solstice is when the sun's highest in the sky. Then we have the fall equinox, boom, about there, when the sun's just crossing the equator. And then you have winter solstice there. So that's the only thing that gives you the seasons. The Earth's orbit is basically circular. It's just the directness of sunlight, and the directness of sunlight just comes from the fact that the Earth's axis is tilted relative to the sun. Has anyone here heard of the ecliptic? Okay. The ecliptic is the path that the sun follows around the sky. So in the celestial sphere model, really the Earth is going around the sun, but in the celestial sphere model, the sun is just another star, and over the course of a year, it goes all the way around. So here's, I think this one's March 21st. The sun's right in the equator. On June 21st, the sun's about here, and actually if you know the constellations, you may even see that the right constellations are nearby. Here's September 21st coming up. And then that's November 21st. So that's over the course of a whole year. Sometimes the sun is lower in the sky and sometimes it's higher. The tilt of this circle to the equator is exactly the same as the Earth's axis. The Earth's axis is that way, tilted compared to its plane of the orbit around the sun. So I, I use all these sorts of blender things to try and help get across um, these sorts of 3D relationships. So I'm going to ask you one more question. But before I do that, um, who here can tell me why the moon has phases? And it's not what that long professor was saying, right? Yeah? Okay, so that's what most people think, and that's wrong. Yes, so an eclipse is when the Earth's shadow hits the moon, yeah? That's right. So it's real tempting, and, and so don't feel bad about this, because people who have had years of astronomy still think it's the shadow of the Earth on the sun. I had a student in my astronomy class the other night, we're in lab, and we're looking at the moon, and it was a gibbous moon. Does everyone know the word gibbous? That's when it's between half and full. And the student's saying, wait a minute, how can there be a convex shadow on the moon from the Earth? That doesn't make any sense. Well, and it doesn't, because it's actually not the shadow of the moon on the Earth, but that's what a lot of people think. So I have a little... If I can remember the file name, Moon Rock 2, I think. All right, so here, the sun is, is that way. And so here's the Earth, and here's the moon. And there's just, that's the side that's lit up. And over the course of one month, that was your cue, thank you. Over the course of one month, the moon goes around the sun, but it's always the side that's towards the sun that gets lit up. Right. So here's what we see. Right. From the Earth, we see a half moon right there. If we go a little bit later in the month, so we'll go forward about a week here. Now from the Earth, we would see the gibbous moon. So it's, it's more than half, but it's not all the way full. You may also notice that the same side of the moon is always pointing towards the Earth. That's also true. Um, here's the full moon. Now this is when you get a lunar eclipse. Every so often the moon lines up perfectly with the Earth and you get an eclipse. We don't have one here. So that's the full moon. 
I think we'll do the second half. No, we'll skip that. Oh, yes, we do the other half. So here's another half moon. And then a crescent moon is the last thing we'll do. There's also new moon when the side that's lit by the sun is on the far side of the moon, so we don't actually see it. All right, so there's a thin crescent when you're just seeing just a little bit of the edge that's lit by the sun. So that's what causes the phases of the moon. Now, notice the way the moon is going around the Earth here, okay, counterclockwise. We're looking down on the north pole of the Earth. And the Earth actually also rotates this way. I didn't have the Earth rotating because that looks really spastic. Um, let's jump ahead, jump. Good, okay. So I just want to show this again. So keep in mind the way the moon is rotating. Um, and the fact that the moon goes all the way around the sky in about a month. And can you tell me if on one night you look and you see a half moon about here, okay, it's that half of the moon. Some of you may recognize uh, Scorpius and Sagittarius here if you're amateur astronomers, but if not, don't worry about it. You see the moon there. Tomorrow night, which of these four pictures is closest to where you should see the moon? in about the same place, moved off some to the right, moved off some to the left, or has it moved, you know, far enough away that you don't see it at all? All right, so we have, we have a, a, a somebody in favor of either to the right or to the left. So, okay, so you've just phoned a friend and they've ruled these two out, or whatever. Which one is it, right or left? You think it's to the right? Who wants, who wants B? Who wants C? Okay, so we have more in favor of C than B. All right, so here's the way, here's the way we, we can answer this. Here you are, and here's, now you see the spastic Earth. Here's a whole month going by. In a whole month, the moon goes around once in the direction that I had pointed out before. I know. Zoom back in. Now, here's one day. Oh, whew. not quite so fast. All right. Sun is to your right here. So we'll zoom in. And from the point of view of the person, except that we leave the camera fixed as the Earth rotates, that's what the moon does over one day. So it was C. It goes off to the left. Here's what the person really sees, of course, rotating around with the Earth. We come back, and there's the moon. So we don't see the moon moving like that. You actually see it moving across the sky with all the rest of the stars, and you have to pay attention to Notice it moving. Um, I, what I'm going to do now is actually go into the Blender file I used for that last animation and show you the sorts of things you see when you're mucking about with the interface. Does anyone want to ask me any questions before I do that? Say what? Yeah, so the interface was designed to be efficient for people who already knew it, right? Which, um, honestly, if you think about where it came from, and actually maybe more software should be written like that, right? Um, where it came from was an internal in-house with people who are going to be using this every day, all day long. So it doesn't have the most intuitive interface to learn. I learned it over the course of a weekend. I always thought, hey, I want to play with this, but I had never done much. When three days before my class was going to start, I thought, hey, I should make a Celestial Sphere video. And I spent about three days solid, and I got pretty used to it after that. But you just live with it a lot, and it starts to make sense. But it's not intuitive, really. Now, they have been, it's actually, when did you last look at it? Okay. It's better than it used to be. Um, the menus are more intuitive than they used to be. Um, they sometimes have words that say what they mean instead of little crazy things that you just have to, to learn. But there's still some of that in there. Yeah? Yeah, that's still there. That's just one of the, you, you know, you've got your sphere, your cylinder, your plane, your box, and your monkey. It's the basic platonic solids. Right? I'll show you what he's talking about. No, it's sad. Uh, which one was it? I always get that. B language is not found. Okay. Here is the interface for Blender. Um, let's see. 
add mesh monkey. There it is. Um, it's just one of the objects that you can have. Anyway, hang on a sec. Where did it go? You want to? Yeah, I could render the. Well, here, let me. Um, yeah, I don't know how to do that. So, oh, uh, okay. It's this is not the best place to do this because I have so much other junk in here that now you can't even see the monkey anymore. So I'm just going to delete the monkey. Bye, bye, monkey. Gone. All right. I did. I killed the monkey. Sorry about that. All right. So anyway, here is your Blender interface. And as somebody already pointed out, um, I can zoom around in this because I know how to use the thing. The thing is designed so you keep one hand on your mouse and one hand on the keyboard for most things. Um, there's no room left for the microphone. How's that? Now I feel like Elton John or somebody. Okay. Um, yeah, so anyway, so it's one hand on the keyboard, so you know, you set it up, I'm using the middle mouse button to drag around, hold shift in the middle mouse button to rotate around, the mouse wheel zooms, or control in the middle mouse button zooms. So you can see all the elements of what I had in this animation, except what the heck is this big sphere? Nah, that's the stars, actually. All those stars I had on the outside, I used the same thing I used in the celestial sphere without the grid. I just made a big sphere outside my whole thing. Um, all right. This thing right here, why is it not selecting? Yeah, this is the camera, and it's supposed to select when I right-click, but it's not. Oh, I know why. I mean, um, that's why. Okay. See, again, it was in some weird point editing mode, and I had to press tab to go out of that. Oh, <laughs> right. It takes some time to get used to, but it's worth it if you're interested in doing anything like this with this stuff. So this thing here is the camera, and if you try and line up with the camera, this view up here is the view that the camera is giving you. Right? It's sort of convenient. I often have multiple windows, and you, you can divide and make as many of these windows as you want. You can have multiple views on the thing at the same time. I usually like to keep one that's showing me what the camera has. Um, and let me just make sure we're on the first frame of the animation. So you may recognize this thing here as the first frame of the animation. At any time you want, you can just go over here and render, see what you get. Boom, there it is. Although when I, uh, yeah, it seems kind of fast. Most of my animations tend to be really simple. I have spheres. Um, I, don't, I don't have tremendously complicated, you know, serenity with plates coming off kind of stuff, um, which is nice. It makes it fast because some of these things, you know, I just render it on one computer. Um, would take a while to go. All right, so here's the camera. Um, you can obviously move stuff around. And notice as I move the camera, the camera view moves around. I'll just go back to where I was. This thing here is the Earth. Um, these various buttons down here let you, you know, are you editing things about the object? Here's the material. You can sort of see this little Earth map down there. Um, it's just an image that I got. There's various places on the web. There's a guy at JPL who has um, maps. Uh, what's his name? God, I was in play with him once. David Seal. Um, who has maps of all the planets designed for wrapping with 3D programs. Um, so, you, you know, it's a great source for all that kind of stuff. So I, I went in with a texture, and I, you probably can't read it here, but there's a, a texture image that I just told it to wrap on as a sphere, and there it is. There's the Earth. Um, moon, similarly. Now, the, for the woman here, I didn't mess with textures. Um, I just sort of divided her up into little parts. Now, the woman figure is something I got off of one of these model archive sites, and I checked with the guy, and he said, oh, yeah, it's fine to use. I know. The, I did this before the monkey. All right, this is a pre-monkey. There is a thing that I haven't played with yet, a Python script for Blender called Make Human, which I think is somewhat like RenderMan. Has anyone played with RenderMan as a commercial package? So um, Make Human, I think, makes little human figures. I haven't, I haven't tried it. Anyway, so for the woman, I don't actually have a texture or anything like that. I just said make it red, make the shirt red, make the pants, jeans. Know, make the hair. What was she? She's a brunette. So there you go. Um, now, so that's so just making the objects is is pretty simple. Unless you want to make something fancy. But if you're just making spheres and putting in other things, it's pretty simple. All right. Um, 
what I spend more of my time working on, once I sort of figured out how to wrap all this stuff, I spend more of my time on the animation of all this stuff. And the thing that starts moving out, or moving around, if you remember, is the camera. There's a couple different ways you can animate it. Um, this, do you see this number one right here? That's the frame number. Um, if I'm, I'm just holding down the right key, and there goes the animation, you can kind of see where things are going to go as you hold down the, the key. And, you know, here's where things were rotating, all that. And it's just incrementing the frame number. Now, one way you can animate is just move everything to where you want it. Um, it's probably something like 24 frames a second. So you say, I don't want it to take four seconds to get there. So you go to 24 times four, which is 100, more or less. Um, go to frame 100, and, and you press a key, I, whatever, that inserts what's called a keyframe. Um, and then what Blender will do is, between all the things you have labeled as keyframes, it will just interpolate the movement from frame A to frame B and all the frames in between so it gets from here to there. Right, that's sort of the simplest way to do animation. You pick out a few key spaces where you know where you want things to be, and you just say, get there, and it'll go sort of in straight lines. Um, you can be more fancy than that. So that's how I usually start, actually. I know I, had, I started with the camera here, and I knew I wanted it to get to there, so I'd be looking down on things. Now, if you look, these little things over here are called IPOs, and I don't, honestly don't remember what they stand for. But there's all these little curves that correspond to the position of the camera. And the way I did it is, you know, I started out with the camera here, and I moved it, and I said, okay, here's where I want it. I made a keyframe. But then you can go in and mess around with the little Bezier curves on this to make it smooth or not. Have you, has anyone here messed with Bezier curves and drawing programs, that kind of thing? No. So anyway, that's how you make the whole animation smooth. You can play around with that. If you really want to be anal retentive, which frequently I do, you can make sure the numbers are exactly where you want them to be. I want the moon to rotate through 360 degrees in a month, not about 350. Um, so I tend to be pretty anal with that sort of thing. So you can actually go in here then and sort of tune and make things work the way you want them to. So we'll keep going forward a little bit. Now, there's a trick I use. I'll show you in a minute. Well, there's two. Yeah, I'll show you the trick first, and then I'll show you the more obvious thing later. Um, let's I'm going to rotate a little so I can see what I'm doing. Okay, there's this little square at the center of the earth there, which you don't see. Um, the reason I have that, you may remember later on in the animation, um, I had... You remember right towards the end, you see this thing up here. I had this whole thing where I rotated the camera around with the earth. In fact, over here you can see this happening. Here's the camera rotating around with the earth. Um, I could have done that by putting in a path and rotating the camera and keeping the direction of the camera pointed at the same time. That would have been very challenging. What I did instead is I made this little square, just a nothing thing at the center of the earth that you'll never see, and then I parented the camera to the square. That's what this dotted yellow line is. And then I just rotated the square once. That keeps the camera pointed right at the earth where you want it to. Um, and it keeps it pointed in the right direction as it moves around. So, you know, as you do this a little bit, you learn some of the sleazy tricks to make things do easily what you want to do. So, first form of animation, you just move stuff where you want to go. You rotate them the way you want them to be. And you say, okay, get there, get there, get there. And then maybe you go in here and you, you tune the rate at which it does in the exact frame when it gets there. There's one other way you can do it, and that is if you actually look at the moon here. Um, as the moon's rotating, let's go earlier where the moon rotates more. Here, I'll do this on this. Yeah. All right, so early on, the moon makes one complete cycle around. I've actually made this purple thing here is a path for the moon. I've made it a circle because I'm an astronomer and things are all very simple. But again, you can make it whatever the heck you want. Um, and over the course of, by default, however, 100 frames, okay? Over the course of, by default, um, about 100 frames, the object will follow, go from the beginning to the end of the path. But again, I have one of these little curve, these things over here that notice it goes from, um, I'm being spastic here in my zooming. All right. From frame 100, here is it is at 1. You probably can't read that, but this value is 1 here. This value is 0 down here. It goes from 1 to 0. I actually have the moon going backwards, um, probably just because when I put it in, I found it was going the wrong way, and I turned it around. Um, so that way I can tune exactly how many frames it takes to go all the way around. And so then later on you can see here, um, 
that I have a smaller amount of motion for these later parts of the moon. So you put in a path and you can have full control over whatever you want it to do. Now one thing, as I mentioned earlier, I haven't done yet, but I probably will do when I get to the point of wanting to simulate where the stars are in a spiral galaxy, which is also much more complicated than you think. But I won't go into that right now. Ask me later if you want to know. Um, I'll probably actually use some Python to go in here so I can really sort of anal retentively solve the equations of where the stars are and say, please put a star right there. Um, so anyway, so at any time along here, um, you're doing this. You can sort of get a render to make sure things are looking uh, the way you want them to. When all is said and done, uh, right, so there that is. When all is said and done, you can tell it um, start and end frames and click animation and walk away and it'll generate a huge number of files on the disk, which I then use something like M encoder to put together. Um, so I, that's basically, that's most of what I wanted to say. I'm happy to answer any questions about astronomy or how I've used Blender for astronomy. If I wanted it to be right, yes. If I didn't want it to be right, I would just do this. Um, I would do this. I'd click scale. I'd click X. I would scale it. Oh, oops. No. Nope. Scale X. I would scale it in X and make it an ellipse. All right. So now it's an ellipse. And then I would move it so it's no longer centered. And, oops. And there you go. All right. So if you just want to make it look about right, it's real easy. If I wanted to actually have it right, and then the other thing is, of course, the comet moves faster when it's closer to the Earth. If I wanted to have it move right and I wanted to put in Kepler's laws, then I would use a Python script for that. Um, with not, yeah, well, yeah, whatever. But, but I could probably approximate it pretty close just by then playing around with the Bezier curves here and just until it looked about right. I, I'll tell you, that's what the people do when they're doing science fiction movies. I, I, Babylon 5 is one of my favorite shows ever. And because, as a physics nerd... Um, the very first episode, uh, how many here watched Babylon 5? Right. Not enough. Um, the very first episode, there's a scene where uh, the captain is out in his fighter, and they're chasing down some pirates, and they're going through an unrealistic cinematic asteroid belt. Um, but the ships are unlike Star Wars, where they all bank off dark energy or whatever they're doing. Um, they're all obeying Newton's laws, and so they'll be going one direction, and they'll turn around, and they're still going that way until they fire their engines and all stuff like that. And I actually knew one of the animators who worked there, and he says, no, we're not calculating Newton's laws. We're just doing it so it looks about right. But what the heck? You know, it looked good. I liked it. Question? Oh, I'm not going to solve it. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take, um, uh, I'm going to take somebody else's approximation that makes it look about right. Yeah, I'm not going to solve an in-body thing. There's people who do that kind of stuff, but they, you know, then you know, write it up and publish it. I'm not a theorist. <laughs> That's hard. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take some sort of toy models that get across the point of how things move. But even getting those to work right will require me to have more control than just this, of a, a large number of small objects. Yeah. Any other questions? So Blender is actually capable of writing out PNG and JPEG files for individual frames. Um, I think it is capable of writing out an animation all at once, but I haven't done that. I usually just write out a million JPEG files, and then I use something to encode it into an MPEG for a movie. Um, so if you want to actually, um, let's see a second here. If I can, if I can get online. Okay. Well, I won't do it then. Um, if you search for Rob Knopp uh, on Google, you find my homepage. And if you go to Astronomy Education Resources, you can find all the movies I've made online there. Um, and they are MPEG-4s. They work with the DivX codec, I think. I just use MPlayer or on Linux or Zin. Z-I-N-E. How do you pronounce that? Zinni? Zina? X-I-N-E. X-I-N-E. Um, any of those actually play them just fine. Um, I think Windows Media Player doesn't play it unless you download a codec, but I have a link to that on my site. Um, so the movies I've made are all standard MPEGs. Blender makes any standard image file, and you can then encode them into movies if you want. So it depends what you want to do with it, but that's what I've done is that. Other questions? Yeah? Yeah, I don't even know what it imports anymore because the people have written Python extensions to import all sorts of different stuff. So the, the woman that I showed you was in 
some other file format, and I honestly don't remember what it was. So I have imported some stuff. I mean, I think I've seen importers for um, DXF files. Um, some of the standard stuff you could find. I don't know if there's importers for quote unquote everything. Um, and I think somebody's written exporter for POV Ray also, if you really want to do that. Um, but, but it will import a bunch of stuff, and more so than it did two years ago when I made that Celestial Sphere movie. Yeah. Um, the, the thing to do for Blender is go to blender.org, and there's, there's a million resources on the site, including scripts people have written to do stuff, import different file formats, things like that. Any other questions? One more question? All right, if not, oh, sorry. Rob Knopp, R-O-B space K-N-O-P is my name, and you'll just get my Vanderbilt homepage if you do that. Um, sorry? Oh, no, just two, two words, Rob space Knopp. That's just my name. Do that in Google. My homepage is the first thing that comes up. Um, astronomy education resources uh, on the left side, and then you'll see my movies from there. All right. Thank you.